Well, welcome uh, again. So this is the third iteration of sessions for today of Fair Psychology Foundation Presents Book Expo 2016. We'll, we'll uh, go through her biography and say a little bit about the book. So Patricia Pearson's work has appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times, and Business Week, among other publications. A former member of USA Today's op-ed board of contributors, she recently gave a TEDx talk, which is wonderful, called Why Ghosts Are Good For You, which points to research showing the importance of near-death awareness in helping people cope with grief. She was a finalist for the Laycock uh, Memorial Mel Medal for Humor for her best-selling comic novel, Playing House, which was a later, later adapted on television. Pearson's series reporting and commentary appears regularly on matters ranging from wildlife conservation to mental health to murder. Recently, she oversaw the research for a History Channel documentary on the science of the soul and went on to publish the book that we're going to talk about today, which was also a finalist for the British Columbia National book, book Award, I think. The documentary version of her earlier book, A Brief History of Anxiety, aired on CBC in 2012. So open, Opening Heaven's Door is the, talk, the book we're going to be talking about today. What, are the, what the dying are trying to say about where they are going. And I'm going to leave you to read this. All of the PowerPoints are downloadable, and you'll be able to get them and bring it down to your own computer. So I just wanted to say that these, this book is, is uh, very well reviewed, I must say, and, and we're going to have uh, Patricia's going to talk about it in just two seconds. I'll get out of the way. She's not only talking about near-death awareness, which we would call deathbed witness, it, which I like her term much better, I must say. I think it's more descriptive and more correct. She also delves into out-of-body and near-death experiences, examining stories and research to make sense of these related but distinct categories. So I'm going to move over to our five questions, which we hope will guide part of the information that Patricia portrays. I want to say thank you very much for saying yes to come and do this for us. We're very interested in this book. We have a good group here today, so I'm sure there are going to enjoy this. Um, you can go ahead and turn your mic back on, and I will turn mine off and my camera off as well so I can get out of your way and let you have the floor. Okay. Um, so, uh, hello, everyone from Toronto, Canada. Uh, so, just, I don't know who I'm talking to because all I'm seeing is my own um, uh, questions for this book. So, I'm just assuming that you're all uh, able to hear me, and if not, let me know. Um, so I, uh, this book uh, started as a result of some experiences in my personal life, in my family, um, in 2008, uh, where uh, my elder sister was in Montreal and awake in her bedroom at around 3 in the morning, uh, the night that my father uh, unexpectedly died in his sleep um, 100 miles uh, to the east of her. And she suddenly became aware of um, a, a presence in her bedroom. And this was not something that she was prone to or had any prior knowledge of or interest in. Um, it, just, it just became this, this very vivid sense of a presence uh, in her bedroom and then actually a tactile sensation of uh, hands cupping gently on the back of her head. Um, and then this was accompanied by a uh, sort of diffusion into her bedroom of a, a kind of um, uh, almost ineffable sense of, uh, of an energy that made her feel elated and content and peaceful and joyful. And this went on for about two hours into the pre-dawn um, morning and uh, was extraordinary. I mean, she, you know, was, she just had no idea what the precedent, what, you know, she thought she... She actually had no idea how to categorize the experience at all. Told my nephew about it, told her boyfriend about it, um, and then found out that my father had died. Um, and so that was a very galvanizing moment for my entire family. Um, and, and, we, and we immediately understood it on some level as being um, that somehow my father had gone to my sister um, in the moment of his death, although we didn't have any language around that. Um, or any prior understanding of that. Um, and so uh, in the aftermath of that, although my background as a journalist is not in this area um, at the time, I didn't know 
I didn't know anything about uh, Carlos and Nancy and all of the other people I've subsequently um, become familiar with is doing this, this work. Um, but when I mentioned what had happened to Catherine the night that she died, two people around me, um, I was very surprised to discover um, how common this was and uh, that people just didn't want to talk about it. Um, they didn't feel the permission to, to articulate it because they thought they were going to be told, as I was at various points, um, immediately, oh, she was just imagining that. You know, as if we would say that when somebody comes to you and says, I've fallen in love, and your immediate reaction is to, is to um, reduce that to something. Um, it's, it's extraordinary how common it is for us to feel permission to be um, prejudicial and dismissive of people's subjective experience in this one area and not in, not with respect to anger or envy or, or depression or anxiety and so on. So that began um, my interest, but it was a while yet before I formally got involved in the subject because my sister then started to die. Um, and uh, it was nine weeks between my father's death and her death. And during that period of time, when she wound up going into a hospice in Montreal um, from inflammatory breast cancer, um, she started to exhibit um, subjective um, experiences that were also novel to, to my family. Um, and they included um, what I now understand to be called nearing death awareness. So um, she um, had an elevation of mood toward the end of her life. Um, she became extremely radiant and serene. She was no longer afraid to die. She began to speak in metaphors of journey. Um, so she talked about um, when was the airplane going to take off, and she got mad at the, quote, hapless flight attendant, unquote, that only she could see. Um, she began to have visions um, in the room and uh, speak happily and joyfully to someone that I couldn't see. Um, so these were all experiences um, that, uh, at the time, we had no, no way to understand. We were just sort of watching in awe of what was happening with Catherine. Um, and, and, then, and, then, and then she died in the late May of 2008, and about a, a year later, I began to research this book. So what I was trying to do with, with my, my research was follow the beats of these experiences and um, delve into what is the available material and, and research um, around the world and historically on these things and also what are people's accounts? You know, where, where do the accounts um, begin to exhibit core commonalities? So I started with the first question, of course, was the sense of presence. Um, you know, what is a sense of presence? What does it mean to feel that? How does that feel different than something that you're purely imagining? Um, so I interviewed a whole number of people who had this experience, um, and I and I started to go away from just um, the death experience and um, discovered that the sense of presence experience occurs in uh, different categories of, of human life. So, for example, there's um, a phenomenon called the third man factor, um, in which explorers on tops of mountains and um, or at the polar um, edges or um, solo voyagers at sea, or people caught in um, extreme conflicts in, in war, um, also have a sense of presence experience. And in those cases, they um, it's almost functioning like some sort of guardian angel figure, so that they, they're accompanied out of the danger realm by this sense of presence. Um, and what was so interesting about that to me was that um, when you look at these occurring in these different areas, um, scientifically we're coming up with different explanations for them. So mountain climbers, well, it must have been, it's a unique experience to mountain climbing and it has to do with um, oxygen deprivation at high altitude. Um, and they boxed it in there and nobody compared that to what happens when the bereaved experience sense presences. Uh, and nobody compared that to what happens when people at a low altitude, um, for instance, on the on drifting on the ocean, experience that. Or one explanation is sensory deprivation that you feel, um, you know, if, if if you're in a in a sea of white, for instance, in the Arctic, then um, your mind will automatically um, conjure a presence because 
um, we need to have stimulation. Um, but then, but then it was occurring in jungles in Africa uh, to prisoners of war escaping. So, so uh, what then becomes the core experience, um, notwithstanding these different environmental accounts of what is actually neurologically going on? And it seems to be that the core experience has something to do with emotional needs. Um, so, you know, what that then suggests about what, what's causing humans to be able to conjure these presences, um, I leave for others to decide. But, but that seems to be the core trigger effect is a kind of emotional stress. Um, so I looked at that, the sense of presence experience. I also wanted to look at it from the point of view of um, uh, the negative as well as the positive. So it's not always just um, uh, a consoling experience. It can also be what happens with people who have night uh, or sleep paralysis. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with sleep paralysis um, and the idea of somebody coming into your bedroom when you feel paralyzed in the middle of the night, you can't move, they, they kneel on your chest. Um, and you're filled with a sense of absolutely incredible existential horror and dread. So that's certainly a sense presence experience, and albeit a negative one. Um, but what, what, what you find in, in the sense presence experience is that, first of all, it's extraordinarily common. So it's globally, the studies indicate somewhere between 43% um, and in Norway up to up to 75% of the bereaved report sense of presence experiences. So they, they, regardless of their sort of personality infrastructure, that many people in bereavement are having um, some sense of the presence of the person who died um, interact with them or come to them. And it's usually very vivid. So for example, one of the people I interviewed um, who actually was my publisher in Toronto on my book and had never told anyone this experience, um, was driving along a highway about six weeks after her father died, and at a very specific point on that highway drive, felt him enter the car, felt the, the passenger seat of the car lift a little bit um, as if he were settling into the passenger seat, and then experienced him driving along with her for precisely 20 kilometers, and then he left. So that is that kind of vividness of experience. Um, sometimes it's tactile, sometimes it's um, a visual, but more often it's a sense of presence. So that was one piece that I wanted to look at. Um, I then wanted to look at um, some of the things that had happened to Catherine in hospice, and that's where you get into this idea of what's called nearing death awareness. That term, that phrase was coined um, in the 90s, I think, by a couple of hospice nurses um, who wrote a book about it. And it has been sort of increasingly the subject of study. So there's about 11 peer-reviewed studies now on what are loosely called the dream conditions of the dying. Um, and there are certain kind of characteristic elements in what can be witnessed in, in the dying, depending upon how well their pain is controlled, depending upon their disease process. Um, but those would include um, uh, the, what I said about the, the, the usage of metaphor around journey. So this preoccupation with um, where's my passport, I need my shoes, I want to go home now, I have to have a ticket, um, where are the tide charts? So, and it's a very, it's a very odd sort of um, logistical preoccupation as opposed to a kind of euphemistic disguise for I am dying. It, it doesn't come across that way, it comes across as a, literally as a kind of fretting at the airport, which I also saw with my sister, which was fascinating. Um, so, so that's one element of it. Another element of it that Bruce Grayson has looked at a little bit at the University of Virginia is terminal lucidity. And um, that would be um, the experience quite close to death within arguably 72 hours of death or, or sooner. Um, where the person, regardless of, of whether they have um, advanced dementia or brain cancer or um, some other disease that, that um, severely impaired their lucidity, suddenly becomes clear and they're able to communicate clearly and with awareness to the people around them. 
um, before they revert back um, to either be, you know, lapse into coma or, or subside in some other way. Um, so, and that, that's something that's only been studied sort of periodically um, in very scant ways over the last hundred years. Um, and it's uh, an area that's really ripe for research, I think. It's difficult. It's difficult to, to capture these things because it's like being a wildlife photographer and you're having, you're, you know, you, you have to hunker down and wait and hope and see if something like this is going to actually occur in a very intimate context in, in someone's dying. So how do you scientifically wait for that um, to happen? Um, it's a bit of a quandary. There have been some studies that have looked at the dreams and visions of the dying um, where um, hospice doctors and nurses are able to ask retrospectively, you know, what did you know, who what did you just see? Or, you know, what were you dreaming? Um, so in, in that case, they're finding very, very high percentage. I think in a, there was a study in Buffalo last year where it was eighty eight percent of um, over eighteen months of patients who were having visions of deceased relatives and or dreams of engagement with deceased relatives and or um, visions of, of um, something sort of um, marvelous and beauteous, um, otherworldly, that they wanted to reach toward or felt that their consciousness was split between this world and, and that um, whatever that perception was. So it's very high. And I think that one of the things that's important to remember is that it's quite recent that um, we've even sort of been able to witness people in uh, a non-ICU context. So um, the early research on some of this stuff was being done in the late 19th century and the um, early 20th century by people like Sir William Barrett, who's looking at deathbed visions. Um, Carlos knows a lot of this early research. Uh, and then it all, you know, the medicalization of death sort of stepped forward and a lot of it got um, lost. Uh, experientially, it got lost. So you'd have people who were too heavily sedated to manifest these kinds of shifts of consciousness. Or you had families that weren't committed to be in the room as the person was dying. Um, so this is really kind of a new window. And I would think the other element to it that is probably unprecedented historically, Carlos, might have a different opinion about this, I don't know, is, is, the, is the level of pain control now um, that we're able to bring to bear, which um, facilitates a kind of pure uh, focus on, on, on perceptual experience, um, not, not distracted by um, the agony of pain. So that's, you know, where that will lead, is anyone's, is anyone's guess, is a very fruitful time for research on on what has been called mirroring death awareness. So that was another piece of what I was looking at in my book. And then I started to go from there into um, interviewing people who had had near death experiences. So people who had gone, you know, flatlined or even just approached the edge of death um, and um, kind of um, shot off into this other realm and return. And my interest in that was not to prove anything. So I'm not interested in whether or not they were in fact medically dead at the time they had these perceptual experiences. That's not what I myself cared about. What I cared about was what phenomenologically did they experience. So what can we say when I look at my sister dying in a hospice and she's radiant and peaceful? What is it that she might be perceiving that is causing her to feel that way? Um, and so that's what I, why I wanted to interview people who've had MDEs. And I think, to me, one of the most interesting things was to discover um, the, the crossover commonality between some of these descriptions of particularly of an immersion in a sentient light. So the idea of finding yourself um, out of body and into a kind of oceanic, sort of synesthetic experience of light that's also love, that's also wisdom, that's aware, self-aware light, that's all these things at once. It's a blend of, of, um, of these 
qualities that, that, that they're for, for, where, for which we have no reference point other than in the NDE, except for in mystical experience. So when you go back, when you hear these descriptions from like the average Joe who was in a car accident in North Carolina, and you compare it to the writings of Teresa of Avila in 16th century Italy, um, it's, it's extraordinary, actually, the commonality. Um, so what is it about that state? What, what the theologian um, Rudolf Otto talked about, the nature of the holy, as a kind of unique um, perceptual state in human experience. Um, that that becomes indescribable, um, for which we can't export language back into our into our regular life. Um, what is it? What is it? What's going on there? So when you when you hear medical explanations about near death experiences, um, the problem is that they're not addressing this really fundamental question of of what is that state of consciousness. So you, you can't just say, well, you know, that, that's because the, the physiological process of dying results in, you know, reduction in, in vision and your tunnel vision and, and so, and then you see flashes of light because that, that has no bearing on, on the complexity and depth of the actual um, consciousness state that people enter into. So we have to be able to find a way to talk about this. Um, as researchers and as uh, you know, as, as fellow human beings, that somehow manages to honor the the, the magisterium, the power of these experiences. Um, the other thing that I was interested in looking at uh, was people who um, there's sort of a class of people who who go into a near death experience at the mere prospect of death. So I interviewed a woman who was a, um, a, a physician who was in an, in an airplane crash, a small plane crash, and when she realized that the engines had failed in the middle of a blizzard in this plane as it was flying, you know, she was medevacking the patient, um, before they hit land, before there was any trauma to her body, she actually went into this kind of near-death experience consciousness state. Um, and found herself in most in love that was light and so on. Um, so, so there's a whole kind of um, um, subplot um, going on there of, of um, a kind of anticipatory state um, that people get into where they go into. Some would argue and have argued that this is a dissociative state, but it somehow reaches into that same plane of consciousness. So that, that, those are some of the things that I wanted to look at um, when I researched this book. And um, my, my goals in doing this um, were in, well, really, in a way, it was the, the simple goal of trying to uh, say, you know, trying to, trying to, to get the mainstream conversation moving a little more respectfully around the depth and complexity of these experiences. So uh, can we please move beyond some of the simplistic scientific theories that are just put out there by science journalist media um, without question? And can we challenge those theories and say, okay, you know, where is the relevance, where, where is it not quite fitting, and so on? Um, you know, how do we how do we open up this conversation in the mainstream discourse? You know, I was after I had spent three years researching this book, there was this piece in the Atlantic um, magazine where they the, the the entire piece was them being all excited because they discovered all of a sudden that the University of Virginia was even studying MBE. And I, I couldn't believe that they were at that such a simplistic level. I was in the middle of this research, and they were just like, wow, look, there's people in America who still do this stuff? I mean, it really is becoming such a disconnect between the advances in natural research and the ignorance of the, of the broader um, media establishment. It's, uh, so, so that's part of what I was trying to do, is I was trying to, to push into that realm. 
Um, and so then how was the book received? And oh, and the other thing I should say about that is the other important thing is that you're opening a door to conversation with people who want to be able to say they've had these experiences without being told they're idiots. And that is a huge thing. Um, it's almost like a kind of um, sort of like the 1960s um, when women wanted to be able to talk about domestic violence. I mean, honestly, it feels like that. People are, they come out to me and they say, I've never told anyone and I'm really glad that you're giving me permission to talk about this. Um, so, that, so that conversation, you know, just, just feeling that you can air your, um, the in, inherent integrity of your experience um, was important and remains important. Um, the way that opening Heaven's Door was received um, was either it was either it was um, acclaimed and um, welcomed um, uh, or it was completely ignored. So for instance the, the New York media who know my work and they I've you know written book reviews for them and, and um, gave them copies of this and they wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. The Daily Beast ran an excerpt, but other than that, the New York Times editor told me, I can't do this because it will, quote, unsettle my readers, unquote. Um, so, so they'll, you know, that, that, and, you know, they don't want, they're not going to argue back to you. They just, they're just going to completely ignore it and hope it goes away. Um, now, finally, the question of what's next is, um, since the book came out, I've been working with um, uh, Dr. Julia Mossbridge at Northwestern and another researcher um, on trying to zero in on one thing that came up over and over again um, in the aftermath of my book being published from people who were emailing me or phoning me or I ran into who'd read it. And that was um, their experience of becoming aware of death or crisis at a distance. So it seemed to be that that was the thing that was very common, um, that somehow they'd become aware, um, either they had a, um, uh, like an inner conviction, it's like uh, one woman was describing that she was standing in a lineup, um, at, and it, you know, it was, it was, it was a, a sale in a big store, and she was buying a piece of computer equipment, and she really wanted it, it was a great deal, she'd been waiting forever in this lineup, suddenly became aware that she had to go home, she had to abandon what she was buying, drop it down with her husband, uh, unable to explain to her husband why she was doing this, storm off, uh, drive home, uh, to get there and to find that her sister had died in a car accident. So that, that kind of experience manifesting as, as that kind of compulsion, that kind of conviction, um, or as a dream, a vivid dream, um, or as uh, sometimes even as a shared symptom. So somebody has a heart attack and somebody, you know, 200 miles away who's close to them uh, feels chest pain um, is what we've been looking at over the last uh, year and a half. Um, and uh, we've been coming, we've been finding some sort of interesting patterns showing up in this research going back to the late 19th century and across different countries. Um, and, and one of the pieces that's sort of emerging um, in the pattern that I find fascinating is that when this happens, when you either have this kind of, when you become aware that someone who has died of a distance through one of these different kind of perceptual ways, it can also be a visual hallucination, you suddenly see them. Um, when it happens, it's far more common for it to be someone above you in generation. So you're much more likely to become aware of a parent dying than a child or a spouse. Um, so, you know, that, we want to take that as one of the pieces of data that we're coming up with and say, and put it out there and say, what, you know, why is that? Why would that be? What does that suggest? Um, obviously, it can't just be coincidence and grief hallucination, you wouldn't even see that kind of pattern. Um, if anything, if these are all just grief hallucinations or wishful reconstructions um, of events, you would think that you would be more likely to see a um, parent seeing a child because, of course, that's where the grief is, is deepest, the need is deepest, but that's not what you're 
that's not what's showing up in these patterns. It's actually somebody from an older generation. Um, anyway, I, there's, there's sort of typing going on at the bottom of my screen that I can't see, but that I'm sort of aware of, almost like the stuff I'm describing here. Um, so Nancy, I don't know whether I'm missing something in your chat, or I just want to open it up at this point to um, questions and observations. Um, Cheryl Lee has written, uh, it seems like back in the 1980s that there was this wave of awareness about NDEs and NDE research. NDEers were on Oprah and Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, was a bestseller, and then we all forgot about this stuff. Do you think this new wave of interest in NDEs is going to have make a lasting difference? Oh, I don't know if it's going to make a lasting difference. That's a good question. I mean, I think all of history is dialectical like mm -hmm. that, right? So I think that each each round of it comes around the corner while arguably while materialistic science starts to crumble a little bit more. It's almost like an erosion, like a wave coming around. And at some point, there's going to be, I think, a an infrastructure collapse with materialism as a paradigm. I would say pretty soon. And then you're going to start to feel, see, that's going to start to take hold. Anybody else have any comments or questions? The the when you were talking about people um, perceiving uh, people in the previous generation, one of the things that I don't know if this is related, but one of the things that Steve Scouten found some years ago when he um, compared uh, the Sonwald uh, case collection from Germany, one of the SPR case collections from the UK, and the Liza Ryan's collection, was that people tended to have these, and he wasn't just looking at like visions or anything, I think it was over the, the whole ca uh, set of various categories of phenomena that people tended to have these experiences about someone on whom they depended. So in some cases, he did find places where a mother would would uh, have this about a son, because and the son was the person who was um, maintaining the person. But it seemed to be uh, someone like that, someone that is on whom you could depend, or were depending, or had depended. And that's kind of interesting in terms of what you seem to be yeah, finding. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it's almost like it's just this kind of, you know, like evolving to be attuned to the person whose survival you depend upon, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, almost a survival. I was going to say almost a survival yeah, skill. Yeah, survival skill. Because, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's some, there's some, some evidence just preliminary from the data that we're looking at that the reverse is true when it's distress that people become aware of rather than death. So, so in, mm -hmm. in way back when with Meyer's stuff in Phantasms of the Living, if you break down all of his cases in terms of the relationship when it was, when it was somebody who like almost drowned or, you know, was almost hit by a horse-drawn carriage or something, then the relationship flips. So then it becomes parents becoming, statistically, there are more parents aware of children than the other way around. So, so that's kind of like, uh, that's I know, I know, but you know, it just, I just noticed that and we combed through Myers about to see, he didn't comment on it, but I thought maybe that's an, you know, a, a route to pursue. Lisa is saying, I remember, um, so oh, I'll get back to you, Elaine, in a second. Um, I remember right after 9-11, I attended a lecture by a man who had died in a rafting accident at the Institute of Noetic Science, died in quotes, and the subject of jumpers from the World Trade Center came up, and he said, oh, they were out of their bodies long before they hit the ground, and he seemed to be very confident of oh, that. Oh, yes. Right. That's that's right. And that that's actually that the chapter in my book that looks at what happens when people anticipate death and before they die. Or, you know, if they're not even necessarily going to die. But, but there is a lot of research on that, that, that they, you know, whether you want to call it dissociation or whatever, that psychologically we do kind of depart from, from the calamitous situation. Yeah. So, so it looks much hor more horrible from the outside than from what you're probably experiencing in the interior. 
Yeah, there's a yeah. disconnect. Um, Elaine was saying, where where did the highest level of resistance come from in terms of um, attitudes towards your research? Uh, well, I would say the highest level of resistance, well, well it's hard to answer because, I, I mean, actually internationally is interesting because the American media is much more resistant than the Canadian or the Polish or, or the Italian or... So there's something about the specific American debate right now with the evangelicals on one side and the sort of secular media on the other that makes them not want to cede any ground in the middle. Whereas other countries are more comfortable, some of this mm -hmm. stuff. So in general, I would say the highest resistance I got was from specifically American media. Yeah, I'm not surprised because one of the one of the reasons why the foundation is doing what it's doing and what, why we put together the the big course that we do in January and February is that um, the opportunities educationally in the United States, even to get a single course in, on parapsychology, have dropped down to almost nothing. Um, it's very impossible to get anything accredited that has parapsychology as part of the content if you wanted to teach it in a university setting at whatever level. And and yet that's a contrast to Brazil and a contrast to the UK yeah. where, um, you know, there's 19, uh, I was just talking to Cal Cooper, who was our final speaker tomorrow. Um, he said that uh, recently we had Chris Rowe, his professor, talking about how many schools there were in the UK where you could do coursework or do a degree that ha had research involved in parapsychology. And, and Chris's count was 16. And Cal said actually there were 19 because there were three other universities where researchers in different disciplines had become very interested in, especially the kind of thing you're working with, spontaneous cases and what they mean and what kind of meaning people take from them and so on. And yet here, you know, forget about it. That's it. You can't talk to them. They're afraid, uh, the accrediting agencies are afraid they're going to be de-accredited if they dare to allow um, anybody even in a university setting to propose a course. So that's uh, definitely something's going on here in terms of the discourse that's blocking out the, the topic. It's really, really unfortunate. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I think that, I mean, that's another thing I was looking at in my book is, is just the, the, you know, people say, well, if there's been telepathy, you know, well, why haven't they been able to prove it? And then you can show time and again where actually the data has been put forward and it's been stomped on. Yeah. yeah. At one point, many years ago, Paul Kurtz, who was the founder of Prometheus Press, and very important in um, uh, the, um, I forgot, the humanist movement and skeptical inquiry and all that stuff, he had said something about, well, if ghosts exist, then we would have hundreds and hundreds of photographs of them. And he made, he made the statement in a conference at uh, the University of Virginia in the 80s, and there was this, like, weird little undertow of giggling going on when he said it because there are hundreds and hundreds of photos but you no know, it's not in his realm of possibility so yeah so i don't know how that's going to change i don't i don't know what's going to shift in the american discourse yeah uh, so any more comments or questions folks Carla seems pretty happy over there. <laughs> so I think you're 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 doing good, and I'm glad to hear about the the new the new project. Um, and Elaine is saying fabulous talk, and thank you. And it really it was really excellent. This is a let me go one more page over so we can show people how to buy the book, and all of this will be in uh, the PowerPoint, which you can download, and the live links are live. And I really recommend. <laughs> Your website. I was really enjoying reading. I felt bad about what I did to your biography. I took some of the humor out of your biography for the slide, um, but it was really wonderful. I was really enjoying what you were writing there. So, uh, thank um, you. Nancy. Well done, you. Really good. So, thank you, everybody. Well, we're just so grateful you came. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Anybody has any email questions, please feel free to email me. You can find me through my website. Okay, great. That's good to know. Are you still collecting uh, experiences? Yeah, I'm, yeah, definitely. Great, great. That's good. Um, okay, well, thank you, everybody, uh, for coming, and thank you, uh, Patricia, for doing this for us. This is great.
we really are, I love being able to kind of get a handle on what are the books that are out there that we should all be reading. The foundation has bought copies, of course. So, and we will definitely put anything in the description that we can to do to help you sell more copies because it's a very interesting, interesting study and looking forward to whatever gets published on the work that you're doing now as well. Thank so you. We have, I'm sure we will speak again about that. I hope so. Yeah. So this is, this is, um, uh, we have the final session coming up at 6 p.m. It will be very short. We're just going to remind you about tomorrow and see if anybody has any general questions. Um, but thanks everybody for coming along. And as you know, the PowerPoints are live in the course. I'm going to embed the TED Talk in the course feed as well. So you'll be able to go out and see that. And um, the, all of these things will be on YouTube probably within a month, I hope. Uh, so they'll be available for even more people after that. So thank you very much, everybody. And thanks, Patricia. Thanks for doing this. This is great. Hey. We're so glad that you said yes. Bye-bye, everybody. See you at 6 for the closing. Hi there, I'm Lisa Coley. I'm president of Parapsychology Foundation. So welcome to our YouTube channel. We have lots to look at, so please check out our videos. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.